Hey everybody, welcome to the ABA's Virtual Bird Club. I'm your host, Nate Swick. If you know me, uh, you probably know me from as the host of the American Birding Podcast, and also I do a lot of the social media work here uh, on the ABA, and I'm excited to host once again. It's been a little while. We've been about a month since our last one. Sorry, there's been a lot going on, uh, but we're happy to be back to do Virtual Bird Club, and we are staying in-house here uh, this month with our own birding magazine editor, Ted Floyd. Um, hello, all the people watching on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, we're really excited about this one. Uh, I don't really have much more of an many more announcements to make. I do have one thing to say. Um, if you stick around till the end of the program, we do have a special ABA membership discount code that you can use if you're interested uh, in helping us so helping support the ABA and helping produce these sorts of programs um, and so stick around for that that will be at the end I'm going to hold it hold it kind of close to my vest uh, for the first part in the hopes that you may stick around a little bit hello everybody hello everyone's coming online the lag is finally catching up um, but without any further ado I mean I don't really have any reason to uh, to to you know, vamp anymore. I'm going to go ahead and bring on our guest tonight. He is you. You know him as the the editor of Birding Magazine, the ABA's bi monthly periodical. And I'm going to um, say hello to Ted Floyd. Ted, how are you? I'm doing fine, Nate. How are you doing? Doing great. Um, how is the summer treating you? It is uh, almost unbearably hot here in the Southeast where I live. And it's been uh, really difficult to do any birding besides watching the house finches build a nest <laughs> under my porch. <laughs> I'll probably be accused of regionalism here, but I can't imagine the Southeast in summer being anything but hot and humid. Yeah, um, we do have yeah, a nice, we do have a winter. Yeah. Fall is gorgeous. I'll just tell you that right off the bat. Fall is gorgeous, but we do have to suffer through the first, you know, eight weeks of, of uh, what feels very much like hell. <laughs> We have had um, very hot weather. We're actually having a thunderstorm right now. I hope that that doesn't um, interfere yeah, with this evening's proceedings. But uh, no, we've been hot and dry, and I guess we're going to be getting a, a monsoonal flow uh, starting. Maybe it's starting right now, actually. But uh, Is that like good for birds? Get. Is late summer a good time for birds in Colorado, where you're located? Yes, but not necessarily because of the, the monsoonal flow. We're really at the northern extent of that uh that said late summer is very exciting we've got a lot of stuff on the move the first of the hummingbirds for example are back already yes. and uh, people a lot are talking of, um, about those here too yeah yeah so uh <laughs> calliope hummingbirds have uh, arrived uh en masse in, in the neighborhood uh, i actually have not seen a rufus yet but the uh broad tails are moving down out of the mountains as well so even though it's uh only july things are, are very much happening that's great um and it, it, you're you're a bug person as well uh, is this time of year, is, are the bugs getting you through this time of year? It's funny, I, I swear um, to the rest of you all, he didn't set me up for this, but I was just <laughs> out an hour ago running an errand. And, and, and um, on a sidewalk of all places, uh, there was just an infestation of, uh, of, of sidewalk tiger beetles. They also often go by yeah, the name, I think backroads tiger beetles, sometimes mm -hmm. punctured tiger beetles. So it's pretty cool to walk along about a Oh, a fifth of a mile of sidewalk and see a hundred tiger beetles. So uh, they're sort of a, a, a late summer. And, well, they could be around throughout the even into the spring and the summer, but they're really starting to pick up right now. So today was my first uh, big day for the sidewalk tiger beetle. <laughs> uh, so uh, what are you going to talk to us about today, Ted? We're going to be looking at uh, sound spectrograms, which are mm, pictorial or graphical representations of bird sound. And I found that these sound spectrograms are just a really great way to uh, to better understand and enjoy bird song. So sound spectrograms are on the agenda for tonight. Fantastic. And before we get started, I do want to say to all the people out there, we're going to do something slightly different this time. We're going to pause every, what did you say, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes in that sort of range uh, and take yeah. questions. So if you have any questions about anything that Ted uh, brings up in this presentation, please feel free to throw them in the comments wherever you are watching. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on it, and we will uh, we will ask those of Ted in our intermissions. I guess we'll have some yeah. intermissions. And, and and just to to be clear, if it's okay, very very brief intermissions. We'll also have sure. the regular Q 
Q&A at the end. But yeah, I intend for those sort of a 10 minute, if, if we want to call them that, you know, 10 minute, you know, break, breaks to be basically just a time for me to get a, get a swig of water. And if there's just some sort of really pressing question, like I just blew right past something that didn't make any sense, you know, let's do that then. And um, we do already have one question, Ted. From YouTube. <laughs> wow uh, is it appropriate for a general audience or <laughs> it is so we did have an issue with that a couple times ago when we did okay. when we streamed on youtube but it, uh, yeah, molly yeah. brown asks why is uh, it called but, the tiger but, beetle uh, uh, but I, was, I have to say this is um this is the first i don't think i've ever given a talk and i've given a lot where a question came before the talk but uh, uh, <laughs> we'll just go right into um, it we're setting the we're setting the tone right off the bat so why is it called the tiger beetle so i so i don't know but my guess is it's because of their voracious predatory that would behavior. be my guess as well yeah tiger yeah. beetles are just a, a fearsome sort of a really diabolical predators of they anything they can get their uh huge their, um, jaws, they they get get their jaws on. So yeah. that said some of them are quite stripy and tiger-like in their appearance but i i suspect it's because of their behavior all right. Well, there you go. There you go, Molly. Um, so, Ted, I'm going to ask you to go to share your screen, and I'm going to throw it over to the uh, appropriate uh, scene that I have set up here, and then uh, you can take it from there. Okay. So, on the count of um, count of whatever. One, we'll, okay. <laughs> so here we go. All righty, and there's a rumble of thunder in the background, and. Ideally, presentation. Hang on a second here. Okay, so Nate, I hope that you all can see the very first screen in my presentation, correct? If we I are good, it. Ted. Go ahead. So, Okie dokie. Well, Nate, you already asked me what I would be talking about, and the answer is, uh, is sound spectrograms. As I mentioned just a moment ago, they are uh, pictures or graphs of, of, of birdsong, and They've actually been around, as you can see here, for quite some time, but they really have sort of come into their own in just the past couple of years. And I just want to share with you all some of the, uh, hopefully, the understanding that I've picked up about spectrograms in the uh, past couple of years, and also the real enjoyment that I've been able to apply to birdsong. But before we talk about spectrograms, I do want to remind everybody that this presentation is brought to you by the American Birding Association. Now, it is the case that all of our virtual bird clubs are brought to us by the American Birding Association. But this one is really brought to you by the American Birding Association because like Nate, I work for the ABA. Uh, you all are my livelihood. And on behalf of Nate and I think everybody at the ABA, I'm really uh, grateful every single day for, um, for making all of this possible for me and for Nate and for the rest of us on staff. Um, if you have not joined the ABA, I encourage you to do so. You can see the URL right there. Uh, members of the ABA receive Birding Magazine, actually Nate, now eight times a year. We've gone from bi-weekly to uh, semi, what would the word be, sesqu something monthly, I'm not even sure, but eight issues of Birding Magazine uh, per, um, per year and then uh, lots of other benefits of membership as well. If you are already a member, thank you very much. Um, let me just remind you, if you're already a member, that we are wrapping up a mid-year appeal right now. And although memberships are absolutely necessary for running the ABA, they're actually not sufficient for running the ABA. And programs like the Virtual Bird Club are brought to you by um, gifts beyond basic ABA memberships. And we're really grateful for uh, any contributions that could help us pass up, or, or pass up, get past our um, uh, fundraising goal for the mid-year appeal. Uh, finally, if you are brand new to the ABA or perhaps even brand new to birding, if you're a bird curious individual, thank you very much for being here this evening. I would uh, commend to you our website, just aba.org, but fair warning, just a few minutes spent at the ABA website can be a very uh, seductive experience. There's fantastic content there and you may well find yourself uh, uh, joining the ABA as a result of poking around our website. All right, from the American Birding Association in the year 2020, let's now actually get underway with this evening's presentation by turning the clock back to the year 1966 and the publication of this book, The Golden Guide. This is one of the real landmarks on natural history publication, uh, on the natural history publication landscape. It's one of the great bird books. I would say really one of the great nature books in the English language of all time. As I said, this book came out in the year 1966. That puts it almost exactly halfway between the publication of the first Peterson 
field guide and the first Sibley field guide. So this is sort of the, uh, the midway between those two legendary field guides, but uh, it's, not, it's not a stepping stone. Some major breakthroughs uh, came about because of this book and a lot of the stuff that we really sort of take for granted in nature observation and just nature enjoyment uh, came about because of this book. This book was a breakthrough in so many ways. And I think the, um, the biggest breakthrough in this book is that it put everything in one place. If you uh, pop open your golden guide, and we'll do this in just a moment here, and you open up to let's say the page showing these buntings, these passerina buntings, that's an indigo bunting by the way on the right, a painted bunting in the middle and a Lashley bunting on the left. It's all there. You can see male and female plumages and uh, spring and fall plumages and uh, immature and adults, even east and west. And that's all on the right facing page and on the left facing page, you have text and maps and, and other information. And that idea of putting everything in one place for comparative purposes and for convenience of use was really a breakthrough with that field guide. And we're gonna take a look at how that works right now by uh, delving into our field guide here. I said there are three species of buntings here. I'm in Colorado, so the one I have most uh, ready access to is that bird on the left, the Lashley bunting. And here is an image that I made with my phone a bit earlier uh, today of um, the account of the Lashley bunting from the Golden Guide in 1966. So this would be the left facing page. This is not the, the pictures. And what's so impressive about this presentation here is the incredible density of information. The text in here is almost a, a miracle of economy. There's so much information in there. Uh, you have that range map down there and you know, we take range maps like this for granted now, but the idea of having a pink for breeding and blue for winter, and by the way, they even show the molting grounds down in Arizona, look at that. Uh, and then the um, hashtags for migration, that black line, uh, that black dotted line, by the way, is the May 1st spring migration isocline. So lots of information there. But what I'm gonna be talking about is this information at the upper left, that sound spectrogram, that pictorial or graphical representation of the bird's song. And the year is 1966. And to make a long story short, these spectrograms never caught on. Uh, just this afternoon, I was texting or emailing, I can't remember one of my uh, uh, mentors when I was a teenager. So Jack High, if you're out there, and he lamented to me that uh, he never quite really got the hang of the spectrograms back in the 60s when this book came out. And that, I think, really applied to almost everybody who was using the field guide at that time. I had the uh, incredible opportunity to talk to the author of this book, Chandler Robbins, just a year or two before he died, about the impact of this book. And it was a very uh, spirited conversation. It was actually sort of silly and, and, and sort of slapstick at times. But when we got onto the matter of spectrograms, again, that information in that red rectangle there at the upper left, Chan sort of turned uh, pensive and sort of almost sad and said he just, it was a pity that these spectrograms never caught on. He said that he really felt that it was a great idea and he didn't understand why it hadn't caught on. Well, Chan isn't with us anymore, but I think that in the past few years, spectrograms really have caught on. They're really widely available for use by birders everywhere. And we're going to take a look now at how spectrograms work and how we can apply them to appreciating the songs of real birds in real life that we encounter, uh, depending on where we are in the ABA area, pretty much every day, at least of the summer. All right. So if you look at that spectrogram, again, that area in the red uh, rectangular like object up there, you see those squiggles on the page there, and then you see a, a grid. And across the horizontal axis on the bottom, you see time marked out in seconds, or actually half seconds, and then frequency, which is the um, how high pitched the song is uh, in units of what are called kilohertz, so zero, two, four, six, and eight. And then the sound corresponds to, sorry, the squiggles correspond to the sound across that two and a half period, uh, two and a half second period of time. All right. I'm gonna guess I've lost about 80% of you all right now, but I hope you don't all uh, flee for the, uh, the nearest restroom or television set or something like that, because I wanna kind of unpack what I just said. And in particular, I wanna say that even if you've never really seriously paid attention to a spectrogram, you actually really have seen them. In fact, you probably see them all the time because a spectrogram is almost exactly the same thing as a musical score. If this were a, a real live talk, I would, um, asks for sort of a, a shot of hands if anybody actually recognizes this musical score. My, my guess is that almost nobody does. I actually didn't recognize until I looked into it a couple of uh, uh, days ago. But this is a 
transcription for piccolo by the French composer Olivier Messiaen of the Song of the Lazuli Bunting. So he has taken, and he actually looked at spectrograms when he did this, I think back in, I want to say 1957, 1958, and he transposed the song to piccolo. And we have this musical score here. We had that spectrogram a moment ago. And what we're going to do now is we're going to convert this spectrogram to a musical score. So there's our axis. You can see the horizontal and the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we are going to measure out time in seconds. And then on the vertical axis, we're going to talk about something we call pitch. Pitch is basically uh, the, the note, how high or low it is. So it looks like we start there at a B flat, and then we jump all the way up to a, I think that's a high A there. And pitch is almost the exact same thing as frequency in hertz or kilohertz uh, cycles per second. They're not exactly the same, but those different notes represent pitch or um, frequency. And then we see how these notes progress through time. All right, if I was down to sort of 20% retention, at um, my last slide. I'm guessing I'm down to about 10 or 12% retention now, but we're gonna dig ourselves out of this hole and persuade ourselves that we really, really can make sense out of music written in the form of spectrograms by going from this rather obscure rendering of the song of the Lashley Bunting to this song. You can read music, you may recognize this one already. This is the most familiar song on earth. More people know this song than any other song. Even if you've never spoken or written or heard a word of English, you probably know this song. As I said, more people know this than anybody. If this works, I'm going to insert, yes, there we go, a red bar here. In the old days, we used to follow the bouncing ball, as you may recall, but what we're gonna do now is, um, is uh, trace this red line here and listen to the song. I think I am um, at maximum loudness here. Um, I'm going to play this here. Nate, if we have a problem, let me know and I will quickly do a volume adjustment. But let's listen do. to this. As, okay, thank you. Here we go. Uh, whoops. All right. Okay, that was happy birthday, Nate. Do I need to make that a bit louder or? If you could make it louder, that would be great. It's a little bit soft. Yes, I But I think it's audible. No, let me make that louder. So folks, we're going to have a, the first, I hope, and only technical um, interruption here. I'm just going to uh, get out of this for The first one is moment. always the tough one. Yes, exactly. So let's get that. I'll get the volume all the way up there and go here. All righty. So this should come through a bit louder now. Um, all righty. Well, I hope um, you that all were better. able to make that. That was better. Okay, very good. Super. The, the, the basic notes there of happy birthday. So we have uh, just traced our way through the uh, first couple of measures of the song, Happy Birthday, using a, a rendering, the musical score that's familiar to anybody with uh, experience with um, Western classical or for that matter, jazz notation. So this is our musical score. We can also take happy birthday and render it as a spectrogram like this. So this is the exact same song that we heard earlier, but now it's in the form of a spectrogram. What I want you to do here is pay attention to, and we're gonna go through this in just a moment here, the individual uh, lowest dark horizontal bars here. I'm gonna show them to you. So this is happy birthday right there. And then all the way at the very end, day to you. So these are the various notes in happy birthday. And let us animate this now and listen to happy birthday. So it's the same song that we heard earlier, but instead of looking at notes on the scale, we're looking at bars on a spectrogram. Okay, we have just experienced happy birthday, the most famous song on earth in the format of a sound spectrogram, the way that we're going to be looking at birds now, real birds, the rest of our time together. So from, actually tell you what, I'm gonna take a very, very quick break right now. Um, Nate, if there has been a question in the chat group, do you wanna let me know about that? And if not, we can move along right away. Uh, there haven't, but I'm gonna give people uh, about 30 seconds to 
ask their question because there is a little bit of a lag and so they are oh, getting to okay. the point where they're going to you know hear you saying this at any point now and i will uh, pose there was one question on uh, youtube but it was about software for making your own spectrograms which i think is something that you're planning on talking about shortly I'm sure, but I'll just very quickly say that these um, the, the images and the animations that you're seeing here are uh, actually just all created in PowerPoint. So I have not imported in any third party uh, software at all here. This is just, um, these are literally PowerPoint uh, slides that we've seen so far. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, and Moving so we'll have other uh, opportunities. Yep, we can continue here. Okay, great. Well, let me move on from happy birthday to uh, this. Well, this is a bird. This is a, a bird song. I'm not telling you all yet what this bird is here. But what we're going to do here in sort of a, a quiz format, I guess, is I'm going to play for you the song again. Follow that red bar. Ted, and... can I pause you for just a second? Yeah. We did have one question that was related to happy birthday that I did. I oh. wanted to make sure that someone got. We got to answer okay. before we moved on. Uh, Beth okay. Leach asks, why the multiple bars above each note? Yeah, so I knew there'd be some uh, technical ringers in the audience here. So, um, Beth, if you're a musician, that those are the um, the, the the overtones, the, the the fundamentals. So, um, because of the instrument that's being played on a piano, in addition to the lowest note that we hear, you get those partials or overtones, and um, you can actually experiment this. Like when you open up the uh, open up a piano and look in, and you can see strings vibrating that aren't just the fundamentals. So you were actually hearing in there. I, I think you know the C above middle C and then the C above that, and probably depending on how the piano is tuned, some Gs and stuff like that. So those are uh, harmonics, or sometimes they're called partials or overtones, and they are, um, they are desired towns, set sounds. If you play just the pure tone, it sounds weird to our ears, at least in the classical and jazz traditions. That's not necessarily the case in other musical traditions. But those bars, again, are um, overtones or harmonics that are largely inaudible to human ears. By the way, it's a great setup because we're gonna be talking about sounds inaudible to human ears uh, in just a little while here. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Um, let's listen to this bird as we watch the red arrow. And I'll give you a hint here. If you live anywhere in sort of the uh, Northern United States or pretty much all of Canada, you're going to recognize this one. All right, whoops, here we go. Oh, sorry about that, um, here. All righty, what we have just heard is, and I think many of you all recognize this, a black-capped chickadee that I uh, sound recorded back on January 25th, uh, several winters ago. That's the famous uh, Phoebe song of the black-capped chickadee. Again, if you're in Vermont or Duluth or Toronto, or for that matter, Boulder County, Colorado, you know this one really, really well. Uh, you can see the various notes in this bird song. We're gonna take a look at those right now. So the first note that we hear is that very pure fi note, followed by a lower note that goes fi. And this is their famous fi b song of the black cap chickadee. Uh, the second song element there at about 3.4 seconds, it just goes fi. And then at six seconds, it goes fi b again. And then at 9.1 seconds, fi. And then at 11.45, fi b. Except that that's not quite right. <laughs> We hear Phoebe and the birds say, uh, sorry, the field guides say Phoebe, but across much of their range, the black capped chickadee doesn't really say Phoebe. It says something different. We're going to take a look at that now by examining this lower panel, which I haven't explained yet. So the upper panel is the spectrogram. Again, that's the plot of frequency or pitch across, across time and seconds, against time and seconds. The lower panel with those big blue blobs against a gray background is called the oscillogram or the waveform function. And you can basically think of it as a measure of loudness. So that first big blue blob there, it's a lot of sound, it's a big blob of sound energy, is going to say, I'm saying, hey, no, hey. And then we see that dumbbell shape there indicating two sounds. And I'm gonna say that that is sweetie. So if you listen to a black cap chickadee, if you listen carefully, if you have a spectrogram, you can actually hear it go, hey, sweetie, three notes instead of two. Now that we know that, I'm gonna back up here, play this one more time, and let's see as we trace along here and follow that bottom oscillogram in particular, if you can hear the three notes in the chickadees song. So let me back up here. Okay, 
And we play it again and see if you can hear, hey, sweetie, instead of just Phoebe. All right. So in the same way that it is for me very beneficial to uh, read a text to let's say a play or maybe read the words to a song, I think it's the same way with spectrograms. When we read along, when we uh, actually, if you will, study the score of a bird song, we can actually detect things that we don't notice otherwise. Okay, I'm going to get us through this black cap chickadee again, but we're not quite done because it was January 25th, 2017. And I guess I was sort of bored that morning. I didn't have anything to do other than spend a lot of time with this chickadee. So this is the same chickadee back in uh, Greenlee Preserve in Boulder County, but here it's giving a totally different vocalization. Now, instead of playing the song first and then analyzing the spectrogram, we're gonna analyze the spectrogram and see if we can hear it in our head before we actually You see that note that goes up and then falls sharply, sort of like a very a steep inverted U of V. I'm gonna say that that's the, uh, the chick note of our chickadee. Um, then we have another similar note right below it. You can kind of guess what's coming next. So we have chick, uh, then those next two notes, those uh, stacks of wavy notes are gonna be D, D. So this is the chickadee, D, very famous onomatopoetic call of the chickadee, the black cap chickadee. And then you see another song element here and you've got the chicka there, but then here we have three Ds, D, D, D. And for the fifth song, sorry, for the third song element beginning there at about 12 seconds, we get the chicka D, 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 D. So you can actually count up the number of D notes there, which I think is kind of cool. The chickadee is actually saying different things with those different D notes. We've learned in recent years that the number of D notes is a surprisingly quantitative and even qualitative measure of an assessment of danger by the chickadee. Chickadee D means things are okay. Chickadee D D means, ah, oh, let's be careful here. And then chickadee D D D D means, you know, something pretty big is going down here. My guess is the chickadee wasn't concerned with me. The chickadees in the neighborhood learn about people pretty quickly. There may have been a Cooper's hawk or something like that in the area, or maybe the chickadee was just um, ticked off at me. But anyhow, I think it's really cool that you can count up the number of D notes and learn something about what the chickadee is saying. And again, just there's a difference between D, D and D, 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 the same way that say in English, if I say so or so, so, those are really different words. It's the same thing with chickadee D versus chickadee D, D. I wanna say one thing about the oscillogram and we're gonna to go to the uh, bottom panel there on the far right. Notice that the, uh, the uh note is actually the loudest note in the bird's call. Um, the um, extent of um, departure from that thin trace line is how loud the bird's uh, call is. And by the way, it doesn't really say chick uh, d d at all. That second sound is also sort of like a constant in English. So this bird really goes chick chick d d d d, but that, that second note is very, very loud in there. So we'll always call these birds chickadees. We'll never call them chick chick. These, but they really are chick chuck these, not chick of these. So that is what we can see from the spectrogram. Let's actually listen to the bird now and see if any of that is correct. All right, Dean. All right, we have just heard the Familiar chickadee, it's a call that, and a, an earlier a song that as I said, any of us in Northern United States and Southern, uh, well actually more than Southern Canada, almost all of Canada uh, would recognize. But I hope we've learned a little bit more about what the chickadee is saying to us as a result of looking at its spectrograms. Nate, I'm going to um, finish up with chickadees now, but move on to um, another group of birds, uh, sparrows in just a moment here. This would be a good time if there is um, a question uh, for me to field that question. I do have a question. That. Okay, great. All right. Uh, from uh, Brody Cast Talbot, who we both of us <laughs> chatted with on an earlier episode of the podcast oh, yeah. uh, a few months ago. Brody Cast Talbot of Portland, Oregon. Uh, hey, Brody. He asks uh, about the overtones. Uh, he understands the overtones of the piano, but if we look at a spectrogram of a red breasted nuthatch or other nasal sounding species, we see the same sort of multiple lines stacked up in those intervals. Uh, do you know how those overtones are created by the bird? 
So I don't know how they're created. Um, that's a problem in uh, avian physiology that is uh, well beyond me. I'll just very briefly say that the birds um, make sound with an organ that is uh, evolutionarily actually quite different from our larynx. They speak with a sing with a syrinx. Uh, they're able to produce more sounds with their syrinx uh, than we are. Also, the, uh, the physics is just quite different. It's much more muscular uh, uh, and less cartilaginous than it is uh, with the, um, the mammalian larynx. I'm going to sort of um, provide a non-answer to Brody's question and say that whether a sound is very um, um, straightforward, just sort of a, a straight line like we saw in the Phoebe or Hey Sweetie songs of the chickadee verses uh, stacked like this, it's a great indication of how pure or nasal it is. In fact, I think uh, you even mentioned nasality in his question. So when we see these uh, stacked partials, as we call them, and it's just a, a stack of, of sounds like that, that indicates a very, very nasal sound. And red-breasted nuthatch, I think you mentioned red-breasted nuthatch, is an excellent example of a bird that just kind of blasts the spectrogram away with those stacked parcels. So that indicates that very nasal ank, ank, ank of the red-breasted nuthatch. And then a very pure tone, like the of the black-capped chickadee would just be that very straight uh, line with no partials at all. So that's my um, sort of a non-answer to, uh, to, to the question. Um, the, the, the physiology, I honestly don't know about. Okay. okay. And we have had some complaints about the sound. Uh, to those of you who are uh, noting that, we are trying to work on that. That this, I can tell you how long Ted and I worked on making sure those bird sounds were audible <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, it's been... Uh, uh, it's been a, a th an issue. Uh, so we'll keep working on that. Um, Ted, what I'm probably going to end up doing is uh, just turning. So give me a few seconds after you announce that you're going to hit play on that. And I'm going to turn it up as loud as I can uh, okay. and make sure that, you know, those bird sounds are loud. And then I'm going to turn your voice back down to where okay. it has been. Does that sound good? Sound, yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. That as we move into our next uh, suite of birds here, at least a few of them should come across loud and clear. So from chickadees, um, actually, before I go move on to chickadees, I wanted to sort of a transition with a, a broader point here. And this is the question of, of, of why we do all of this. So I, I hope I've um, made the case that we can learn things about what a chickadee is saying, about how many syllables, how many notes, uh, how nasal or pure, even how much information about danger to the environment is being uh, conveyed. And, and that's, that's totally cool. I think that's a great reason to get into sound spectrograms. Uh, sound spectrograms can also be used to make important contributions to understanding the uh, distribution of birds in, in space and time. Uh, certainly, I've been involved in the documentation of, of rare birds with spectrograms. There are sometimes uh, birds that records committees would rather evaluate in terms of recordings than in terms of the way that they look in a photo or possibly a specimen. Um, I've been involved in studies that have documented range expansions um, that have uh, help to clarify uh, species limits and possibly even the evolution of novel song elements. So spectrograms can play a big role in, um, in amateur ornithology. And I think that they will play a much bigger role in the, uh, the decade ahead. But I'm gonna backtrack now and do a total 180 on you and um, say that I think I enjoy spectrograms more than anything else for the sake of spectrograms in the same way that I really enjoy looking at a beautiful photo of a bird a spectrogram can just convey some really cool information and can help our brains appreciate birdsong in ways that uh, simply hearing the sound without the spectrogram uh, cannot. And we're going to look at uh, a couple of case studies for that in a moment. So as a kind of counter example, I'm going to start us off with this guy. Uh, we're going to play this song. And I think um, most of you, is, well, I shouldn't say most of you, Folks east of about 95 degrees uh, longitude will recognize this song right away. So Nate, if you want that warning, uh, here it comes. I'm going to play this song in just a few seconds. Okay, that was a an Eastern Towhee, but not any old Eastern Towhee. That was an Eastern Towhee at the legendary Ashton track in Newcastle County, Delaware. Um, Nate, I think you actually were with me when I recorded that bird. It was at an ABA event, as you can see a few springs ago. So this is the Eastern Towhee. This is the sort of bird that honestly, um, we don't need a spectrogram for. 
we've known drink your tea, the mnemonic for the Eastern Toei, for as long as any of us has been birding. Uh, that said, you can see the elements of the bird song in there, and sort of a dirty little secret. It doesn't say anything at all like drink your tea. It's not what the bird is saying. It's a mnemonic that works well for us. But if we were to actually um, dub in here the words drink your tea, they would look utterly different from those notes that we see on the spectrogram. And at the very end here, we're gonna see a little bit about how that works. So, you know, this is the song of the Eastern Tohi. We know it as drink your tea. And I think we'll always know it as drink your tea. When I hear that, I smile and say to myself, drink your tea. But most other birds and sparrows in particular sing songs that do not so well lend themselves to mnemonics like this one. This is another sparrow and Nate uh, will be listening to it shortly. I'll we'll give you a, a little bit of a heads up there. This is a, um, a sparrow with a, an odd looking song. You can see those two sort of great big black um, bars of sound there. They show up really well in the oscillogram in the bottom and also fairly well up on the, um, the spectrogram. And then you see those three little uh, clipped descending notes uh, right before each bout of song and then another clipped note at the end. So this might go something like, and uh, for those of you all who spend time in uh, hay meadows and uh, reclaimed strip mines uh, all across uh, eastern and um, northern uh, United States and southern Canada, and by the way, even in the central peninsula of Florida, where the Florida grasshopper sparrow occurs, you know that we're listening to a grasshopper sparrow. So Nate, let's see if we can um, crank the volume up on this one. It's going to be fairly high pitched, but it's a fairly uh, loud recording too. So here goes. Oops, sorry. Here. All righty. So that was, as I said, a grasshopper sparrow singing. Yeah, that's probably the, that, that may be the hardest one, but um, it's high pitched to begin with. What we call the, uh, the carrier frequency of that bird is up around 9,000 uh, hertz there. Um, it's hard, by the way, for many folks to hear, period. Um, I of the age now that uh, grasshopper sparrows aren't quite as loud to me as they once were, but uh, the spectrogram is there loud and clear and uh, distinctive um, compared to any other sparrow, really any other bird. Just a, a quick pause here uh, to, to reflect on, on sparrows. You know, birders love to uh, talk about the best this or the best that, you know, the, the cutest bird, the most ferocious bird, uh, the fastest bird, the greatest bird, I, I don't know, you name it, but at least in the ABA area, I think when it comes to the best sounding birds, and I'm totally a fan of catharist thrushes and winter wrens and, and loons, I think the sparrows are, it's not even any contest. You know, we have like 50 species of sparrows in the ABA area, and every single one of them sings a fantastic song. Uh, and I've really come to appreciate that, especially in the past couple of years, by really digging into the spectrograms of sparrows. All right, so this is our grasshopper sparrow. It says, tip, but I find it easier to actually um, appreciate and recognize the song by way of its spectrogram. Now we're going to move to a sparrow whose song spectrographically is so complex that I have never seen anybody come up with a mnemonic for this one. There's no drink your tea or see me, here I am, or yank, 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 yank. This is just an incredibly beautiful sounding sparrow. Uh, let's play the song and then talk about what this bird is and something really odd that's going on here. So Nate, this is another fairly high pitched one, but I can tell you it's loud from that oscillogram. So get ready to crank up the volume. All right, that was the song of a Cassin Sparrow that I recorded out in uh, far eastern Colorado a couple of springs ago. By the way, um, if Michelle Batiste is in the audience, you were with me when I recorded that. Um, I think you were a couple of moments away from hypothermia at that moment. It was about 35 degrees Fahrenheit and that sort of snowy, misty, northwest wind at 25 miles per hour. But the Cass and Sparrows were really doing their thing there. All right, this is a complex and, and beautiful song and you can tell from the spectrogram and even more so that an awful lot of stuff is going on here. And what's really weird about this bird's song is that what we see spectrographically is not what is described in any field guide. 
I think that the uh, Sibley Guide uh, gets this one perfectly. The Sibley Guide says that the song consists of four notes, a long, sweet note, then a longer trill, and then two shorter notes. So the Sibley Guide tells us to listen for this, 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 and this. Uh, other field guides, by the way, say the, uh, the same thing. I checked the old, um, the, the Golden Guide, the original 1966 text, and it talks about those uh, two notes at the end there. The National Geographic Guide uh, correctly and very thoroughly, as is the want of the National Geographic Guide, uh, notes that often there are two introductory notes. So uh, there's one here, the Sibley Guide notes one, there's actually often a, a second introductory note here. But what's really weird about all of this is there's more going on here. For example, this note and that note. We don't hear that when the bird gives its song. I have listened to thousands of cats and sparrows. I sort of tricked myself into hearing that because I know exactly where it is and I can sort of set myself up for it. But the field guides all tell us that the bird goes, if you will, sort of do, 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 do. And those really loud notes circled up there a little bit higher than the other ones are just not mentioned in field guides and not heard by our human ears. They really are there. And that raises a question, what on earth is going on here? It's a little bit like that Phoebe problem or hey sweetie problem with the chickadees. Our ears hear these sounds, but our brains aren't processing them. Our brains don't hear sounds quite the same way that birds do. Birds can hear sounds, and I'm going to use very imprecise language here, more slowly than we can. They can pick up on things that we don't hear, and they do that. We know this from some really, uh, really exciting uh, neurophysiology work by just slowing down the, uh, the acoustic environment and hearing things differently. That's cool with the cast and sparrow. It was cool with the chickadee, but here's the bird that takes the cake in this arena. It's another sparrow, and if this works well, I'm just going to go to a black screen here. Don't panic. You don't see a spectrogram. You don't see anything here. I'm going to play a bird song for you, and Nate, let's do that at about, uh, well, right now, and let me get set up here. So I hope you got the sound cranked up. And here is this bird song. Oh, and by the way, this is gonna be a very short, brief song. Here goes. Well, that was the entirety of the song of a Henslow's Sparrow. Uh, this was recorded by Andrew Spencer out in West Virginia, a couple of, uh, actually quite a number of springs ago, about 11 springs ago. Um, last I checked, I think Andrew was the, uh, the most prolific recordist of all time on Zeno Canto. So I really appreciate the, uh, the effort that Andrew and his uh, colleagues are doing to get a lot of great bird vocalizations out there. So everything about the song of the Henslow Sparrow is just really, really weird. It's incredibly short and almost all commentators have said that the song of the Henslow Sparrow is incredibly, they use words like wimpy, impotent, feeble, um, inadequate. I think Peterson himself called it like the, uh, the least impressive of all the birds in what we now call the ABA area. But why would that be? Well, you know that sparrows, I've already declared to you, sing the greatest songs. The songs of almost all sparrows, well, all the ones I can really think of, even ones that are sort of run on and monotonous like a uh, dark-eyed junker or chipping sparrow are longish affairs, you know, one and a half to three and exceptionally even four or five seconds long. This poor song of the Henslow sparrow is barely a quarter of a second, I guess about a third of a second there. Well, you can tell from the spectrogram and the oscillogram that there actually seems to be an awful lot of stuff going on there. So what we're gonna do now is, um, it's not really cheating, it's just um, re-rendering this spectrogram to sort of stretch out the x-axis, to stretch out the uh, time in seconds. And we're gonna do that like this. So this is our exact same Henslow Sparrow here. I've just stretched out the time axis, the x-axis here. And you can see an awful lot going on here. So this bird's song is typically rendered in the field guide as like schlick or schlick or slick. Uh, it's not even two syllables, it's sort of one and a half syllables. But the, um, the spectrogram is showing at least six different song elements. And if you count up the oscillogram, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, or 11, 12, or you know, somewhere between like 12 and 14 song elements here. So what we know from studies on the avian brain is that the birds simply can resolve all of these differences in a way that our human brains cannot. They hear the song much more slowly and much more richly. So what I'm about to play for you is sort of a, um, an artist's rendering of the song of the Henslow Sparrow, the way a Henslow Sparrow would actually hear it. We can't hear this, our brains don't work this way, but a Henslow Sparrow brain does. So Nate, 
get ready to crank up the volume here. This is a Henslow Sparrow, the way that a Henslow Sparrow hears a Henslow Sparrow. I think that's so cool we can listen to it again. Now, to be perfectly clear, I don't really know what the song of a Henslow Sparrow sounds like to a Henslow Sparrow, but we know from um, physiological work that they hear it more slowly than we do. One of my kids asked me recently, what does an American accent sound like to a person in Britain? And I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't um, hear American accents the way that a person from Britain can, and I can't really hear a Henslow Sparrow song the way that a Henslow Sparrow does. But I think it is so cool that you can look at this spectrogram of a Henslow Sparrow and see those six or seven elements in the spectrogram and then those 12 or 14 elements in the oscillogram and know that the Henslow Sparrow is singing something so much more beautiful and so much richer and so much wondrous than our human brains are able to process. And if I can sort of take a, uh, actually tell you, what, I'm gonna take a break now because I'm about to, uh, to, to wind up here. I have a sort of um, some philosophical uh, final notes here before we go into the, uh, the actual question and answer. But before I go philosophical on you all, um, Nate, I'm wondering if you've accumulated any questions that I might be able to field at this point. All right, folks, now is the time. We did have a question about what you uh, what do you use to record these from Bridget Butler, friend of the Vermont. Yeah. Hi, Bridget. Um, by the way, folks, um, if you haven't, you probably should have seen your June issue of Birding by now. Bridget has a wonderful article on um, doing a big year in her yard with children uh, in Vermont in the June issue of Birding. Yeah, so to record these sounds, I guess the answer is it depends. I do use a uh, designated, what I call small pocket recorder. Uh, the actual product is the Olympus LS10. I got it used from a friend about 10 years ago. And even though I at one point left it outside, for folks in Boulder County, you're gonna be appalled to hear about this, in a snowstorm in Lagerman Reservoir, and it was found three months later. Uh, it's still working just great. Um, you can also, yeah, talk about take, takes a lick and keeps on ticking. Um, you can use a, a smartphone, by the way, and I'm gonna briefly at the very, very, very end talk about that, but uh, smartphones work great and they work better than they ever have before. You can simply press the red button on voice memos and get perfectly you know, serviceable recordings of uh, bird vocalizations. It really is worth though, investing in the free or 99 cent app that substantially improves the quality of the recording as well. Um, in the old days, we, we re recommended using uh, plugins, you know, external mics for smartphones, and they don't really appear to be worth it anymore. So a smartphone with a, a very inexpensive, I mean like 99 cent expensive or even free app is probably the way to go. Uh, you can also invest in a um, small pocket recorder. Finally, and although I haven't done this in years, you can get, you know, one of those really big, serious recording um, ears, but they're not really necessary for most of us anymore. So, okay. Uh, any other Go questions ahead, later? On. Oh, very good. Okay. okay, move on. Okay, so um, let's just linger here, well, one more moment here with this, with this Henslow Sparrow and um, the sort of sense of wonder that I have when I look at this spectrogram and, and realize that there's so much more going on in the brain of a Henslow Sparrow than I can ever plug into. And one of the real realizations we've had about birds uh, during the past quarter century is this applies to everything about the way that they perceive the world. Uh, there's been some spectacular work published in just the past couple of weeks on how uh, a hummingbird in uh, South America, the Ecuadorian hill star, uh, can hear sounds far higher than uh, we humans do. Uh, not only that, we know that hummingbirds, as spectacular as they are in terms of their plumage, actually see colors um, that we can't begin to see. They, they see um, a much more, a much richer sort of multi-dimensional color palette than we do. So I know picture some incredible tropical hummingbird and then, you know, pictured on, you know, some psychedelic drug. And that's sort of the way that hummingbirds routinely see uh, one another. Uh, birds, hummingbirds, sparrows, and others just perceive the world in ways that we simply do not. But fortunately, we humans have brains and hearts and minds that are able to um, accept the fact that our reality is much more complex than we ever knew. I think almost on a daily basis, I just like to remind myself that the world really is round, even though I can't prove that by walking down the street. 
uh, that species really do evolve, even though I haven't been around here for millions of years to observe it, that the uh, sun really is at the center of our solar system, even though from the perspective of Earth-based observers like ourselves, it sure seems to be the other way around. I just think it's really, really cool that we know that the world around us is so much more fascinating and complex and uh, extreme than we ever imagined. You pick up on that idea a lot in the physics literature, maybe the sort of hard science literature, sometimes in, in math. I think that it's truer and more powerful and it's way more beautiful for us in ornithology than everywhere, than anywhere else. I'd love to go out and listen to a bird or watch a bird or otherwise engage a bird and realize that, that bird is engaged in a reality that I share with that bird that is much more complicated than anything that my ordinary and rather feeble hearing and uh, vision can uh, apprehend for me. Before we move on, <laughs> uh, and I am about to wrap up here, I wanna share with you all that I think to me the most exotic and exciting idea of all, the one that I just love to remind myself of on a daily basis here is what I like to think of as the, uh, the relativity of now. So this is the idea mainly for, from physics that there's nothing special about being right now with all of you all. We know that issue with the relativity of, what I, of here. I'm here, Nate is in North Carolina, others are elsewhere. We get that each one of us is in different places and our here's are just as um, equally valid as anybody else's. It turns out that that's the case with now, that something that happened seven days ago or seven years ago is just as now as something happening right now. Something that's gonna happen seven days in the future or seven years in the future also has actually already happened somewhere in space time. I know that we're all trapped in the now, but physics assures us that the events that we think happened then or that are gonna happen in the future are happening right now simultaneously. So what on earth does any of this have to do with bird watching? Okay, well, bear with me. Um, what it has to do with bird watching is this. I think that we birders, because we're human, love to reflect on the things that we used to see and on the things that we're going to see. We love to remember the past. We look forward sometimes with hope, sometimes with dread uh, to the future. And we're plugging into this ancient, and it turns out very authentic idea that the past is a lot more real than we ever imagined and that the future is a lot more real than we imagined as well. One of the ways that we connect with this idea is by taking pictures. I'm going to wrap up now with some thoughts on Lashley buntings, the birds that uh, got us started there back in 1966. Um, but this is an image from just a few days ago. As you can see, it was photographed by my daughter, Hannah Floyd, on July 9th. I was standing there with Hannah when I took that picture of the bird. By the way, Rob Nyer, if you were out there, you were also standing with uh, Hannah and me when we took a picture of that bird. And there's something powerful and spooky and eerie, but ultimately very hopeful and assuring to know that somehow, out there in a now that I can't grasp right now, Hannah and Rob and I are still standing there with that Lashley bunting. That event is every bit as real, even though we save it in the past as something that's happening to us right now. Now, July 9th wasn't all that long ago. Hannah and I and Rob are about the same people that we were back on July 9th. But I'm gonna turn the clock back a little farther now to uh, this, I think, final song of uh, 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 a spectrogram that we're going to uh, look at and then listen to. So, Nate, I'm going to play this spectrogram here, and I want you all to, if you can hear it, I hope, uh, notice two things. Um, there's going to be a bird there, I'll tell you already, it's a Lashley bunting from about the one second to the three and a half second mark. And we'll just listen to what comes in at the 6.7 second mark. So, are you ready, Nate? Here we go. Lively Bunting, June 17th, 2014. Okay. That is a Lashley bunting that Andrew Floyd recorded when he was a bit younger and his voice a bit higher on June 17th, 2014. It's charming. It's nostalgic. It's sentimental for me to listen to that and to um, be taken back to that point in time now uh, more than six years ago. But that point in time really is still happening. And I find that just to be, as I said, an arresting and powerful and ultimately very hopeful and encouraging 
a thought. It's an assuring thought, really. Laura Erickson has written about what she calls the evocative power of sound. And we feel that we've come back to that moment in sound when we play old recordings like that. But more powerfully, we know that that event still is playing out somewhere out there in space time right now in a way that we humans cannot access, even though it's every bit as real as what is happening to us right now. I know a number of you all have been uh, involved in comet watching for the past uh, couple of nights. I finally got out a couple of nights ago and we had a clear night and looked at the comet. And I've been reading some uh, remarks, quite a number of them, about how this is just sort of a, um, we're in the right time at the right place. The last time this comet came through, and Nate, you may have to help me out here, was like, what was it, 5,600 years ago or 6,800 years ago? And it won't come back again. 6,800, I think. Is that 6,800? Okay, yeah. thanks very much. Um, but what is so powerful to me is the idea that humans, 6,800 years ago, if that's the right number, are still out there in space time, gathered on hills or the earliest uh, settlements that would become cities, watching that comet. And whatever we humans are going to be 6,800 years from now are already gathered watching comets in the year, help me with the math here, 8,800 or something uh, like that. And, and, 20, 88, 40. And I just find that to be such an incredibly powerful idea. It's an idea from physics. I get that it's an idea from philosophy, but it's something that really powers me along um, in the realm of bird watching as well. I'm not going to go political on anybody here, but we are living through a summer for the ages. It has been a very tumultuous summer. It's one that I think is easily um, distracting. It's one that can get us really sort of unmoored from who we are and what we're all about. The idea that birds plug us into a reality that ultimately transcends our human concerns is one that is uh, spooky and eerie and ultimately very powerful and uh, reassuring for me. That pretty much concludes the mm, spectrographic part of my presentation, but I do want to uh, get to something that Bridget and I think somebody else asked about sort of namely, how do you do all of this? Well, it turns out that the next issue of Birding, which is in production right now, the August issue, has a wonderful article by Kathy Borgman at the uh, Macaulay Lab and uh, eBird, of course, up in Ithaca on best practices for recording, recording bird song. If you gave me another two hours, I suppose I could do it, but I know that I don't have another two hours. Uh, I commend to you Kathy's uh, article in the next issue of Birding. It really um, goes into some pretty exquisite detail, but in a very user-friendly way. Uh, all of the ways that you can really enjoy and appreciate and contribute to our understanding of birdsong uh, at the present time. If you haven't caught on to it already, this article uh, is brought to you, of course, by Kathy, but also by the American Birding Association. If you join the ABA, you will receive Birding Magazine. You will learn how to make uh, bird recordings and, by the way, lots of other great content in that issue as well. At this point in a presentation, I would um, say good night and begin to take questions. We can't really do that, but I will um, wave off. I will say good night and I will thank you for your attention. So I am done and I see that we're approaching the hour. I think the format now, Nate, is for you and me to sort of go back into studio, so to speak, here and to feel that questions. That is correct, Ted. Great, okay. Well, I am here and I can linger for as long as anybody wants me to. That sounds great. Ted, would you drop out of the screen sharing right. mode for Zoom, please? Okay, all right, see. Was that successful? Perfect, very good. Thank you, Ted. Clap, 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 all the virtual. <laughs> claps uh that we can do uh, you have to may have to play your sound effect one more time there ted if anyone has any questions about uh ted's talk or bird recording or the aba or birding in general i think we could probably uh manage to take those as well please let us know in the comments uh here on facebook or youtube or periscope slash twitter uh wherever you get it i did promise you a i promised you a code that you could do you could take to get a $10 off ABA membership. And I'm going to give it to you right now. It is VBC 10. It should be floating vaguely above my head uh, right now. If you enter that code, uh, you will be able to get a $10 discount for an ABA membership that is good through Friday. So by the end of the week. So if you want to take that, uh, please, please do so. I'm going to start looking for some questions here from folks. I don't have any, Ted. Do you have any um, anything you want to say? We have a lot of great talk, Ted. Nice job. <laughs> All right. Well Excellent. done. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just I, sort of to, to Kathy's article in, in particular, um, you know, there's this sort of black box question of how do you go from pressing the button on your phone to, uh, to getting the content uh, onto your laptop and then onto the, uh, onto the internet. And that, that's a very fair question for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny, I've, I sort of changed my tune on that over the years. I, I really do recommend now simply starting with a smartphone. So a purist like, well, frankly, Kathy or me or maybe you um, would say that the results will be sort of crude. But, you know, how many of us really start with the fanciest camera on Earth as well? I think that um, you, you'll be really surprised and gratified by just how good and clear those smartphone recordings are right now. Um, while you're actually still on your phone, you can do some basic editing. Uh, you can, for example, clip out sounds at the beginning, which is a very good idea <laughs> often. Uh, and then when you're um, onto your laptop, uh, using some of the very easily available editors. I use Audacity, uh, which is spelled just like it sounds. Funnily Audacity. enough, is the uh, same recording software I use for the American Birding Podcast. Yeah. There are people yeah. out there who listen to the uh, American Birding Podcast. Uh, I use Audacity. Uh, yep. which is the same thing Ted uses to record bird songs. And, and, and I'll ask you, by the way, songs, I should say. Yeah, um, well, either way, but in my case, I uh, record bird, I'm sorry, edit bird songs. There are so many uh, macros and settings and so forth that you don't really need to get into, but just some, some very basic ones, just sort of, I just like, you know, basic photo editing can uh, take a uh, surprisingly uh, noisy in the acoustical sense uh, bird recording and make it actually quite beautiful. So yeah, I just want to encourage folks to get out that phone. You've got voice memos if you're on a on an iPhone already. Press that red button, point your phone in the direction of an ideally fairly loud and close bird, something like a, a robin or a, a yellow warbler, a black billed magpie, a cardinal. You guys have cardinals out east. Uh, and I think you'll be yeah, I think you'll be gratified by uh, by the so results. And you can pretty quickly get that content uh, to eBird and therefore the Macaulay Library. Um, yep. By the way, uh, you know, I know it's a commercial um, uh, program, but uh, SoundCloud is a great place to store your sounds uh, as well. I, I think they're more useful at Zeno Canto or at Macaulay, but uh, SoundCloud works great as well. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Bridget Butler. Uh, how okay. has using spectrograms changed your birding? Yeah. So I'm going to give you two answers there. The second is kind of a out there in la la land, but I think it's actually a fair and accurate answer. The, the, the first answer though is um, is sort of more more straightforward. I think it's just maybe much more um, disciplined about paying attention to bird sound. I've always been a sort of self-proclaimed uh, ear birder. I, I didn't start with binoculars, so I sort of had to listen to birds. Um, and I would just sort of say, well, I know that's a blue-winged warbler. I can just tell that that's a uh, yellow-breasted chat. And that's ultimately, I think, sort of dissatisfying. I think, you know, being able to say why one friend, I'm talking about a human friend now, <laughs> is a friend for this reason and the other is a friend for that reason is a very wonderful thing to be able to do. And I feel that way with birdsong as well. The second answer, and this is where I'm going to go a little weird on you, but I've actually looked into the literature here, is that spectrograms actually change the way our brains work. So there's a tremendous amount of literature really quite recently in brain imaging about the, the value of um, synesthetic learning. So seeing and hearing sounds at the same time. If you spend enough time looking at spectrograms, it actually activates the auditory cortex in your brain. So you see a spectrogram and you hear those sounds go off. And by the way, it's the other way around. Uh, you can hear a sound and see the spectrogram in your brain. Now that may sound... Uh, <laughs> like something out of a Kurt Vonnegut novel. Why would you ever want to see a sound or, or, um, or hear a smell or something like that? But uh, we now know that. Dead. Yeah, it's sure, there too. Okay, good. Um, but we now know that that synesthetic learning uh, is very, very powerful and very effective. Uh, it was sort of erased in um, Western learning with the invention of the printing press about 500 years ago. Uh, cultures outside the uh, literate uh, cultures in the world actually. Um, have a lot more going on in their um, uh, auditory and cerebral, and uh, sorry, auditory and visual cortexes. Uh, it's really valuable to listen to sounds, to um, to look at sounds. And by the way, I'm gone to this realm at all, but to smell things uh, at the same thing, possibly even to taste them and feel them. So uh, that synesthetic learning experience, which comes um, hard to somebody like me with sort of more formal training and seeing and hearing, has I really um, are made richer my engagement of, of the world around me. I have a question from YouTube. 
Whitehead, uh, okay. Rob Hubner. Um, how does this work with night recording of migratory birds? I know that you've done a little bit of that. Yeah. So a bird's flying over at night and you can't see it. <laughs> and the birds that fly over at night tend to get rather short and clipped notes. And that's, by the way, especially the case in Colorado where we get mostly warblers and sparrows moving over at night. So the birds all give these sort of um, variants on tsip or t or tsip or tsip or <laughs> different little sounds like that. They kind of sound the same to our human ears, but spectrographically they look really quite different from one another. I remember an experience of many Novembers ago when we had a, uh, uh, a fog event and birds were coming down low into the street lights uh, at a busy intersection near where I live near Boulder, uh, near, near Denver actually. And um, it was just this cacophony of these little tip and tip notes. And yeah, I guessed that there were chipping sparrows and white crowned sparrows. And it turns out there were actually some pretty uncommon birds in there as well, including possibly Diana Doyle and I have looked at this, including possibly a Nelson sparrow. We still need to I look into that one in a little bit more detail. So you can really make sense of what's going on up there by pointing your recorder at the night sky and then uh, going back to a laptop, looking at spectrograms and seeing how those little notes by uh, virtue of how they rise or fall or stay flat or whether they're buzzy, um, whether they're nasal or not nasal, whether they have two or three bands uh, correspond to the different birds that fly over at night. Do you have any thought about the, uh, this is from Roger Hoffman, uh, any thought about the spread of viral songs in the bird world? I think he's talking <laughs> about that recent observation with, uh, yeah. with the white, white crowned sparrows on the Pacific well, Northwest. Uh, yeah, I think that was white-throated sparrows. White-throated sparrows. Um, one of those. Yeah, zonotrichias. yeah, one of those zonotrichias. Uh, zonotrichias, well, zonotrichia. zonotrichia. But, uh, but um, yeah, that's an incredible um, study. So basically, white-throated sparrows started uh, singing a variant at uh, at some point quite recently, and it's uh, spread throughout the. Um, pretty much the the continent, as, as I understand it, very, very quickly. We've been able to, uh, to track it because so many people are recording um, uh, the songs of white-throated sparrows. Um, two quick notes on that. <laughs> notes, sorry. Um, another zone of trichia, although not one that we have in the AB area. It has actually occurred in Colorado, but it's a controversial bird, is the, uh, <laughs> the rufous collared sparrow, zone of trichia. Um, capensis, I think? It's a South American right. uh, sparrow. Yeah, so, so this bird... Um, sings songs that uh, we know change uh, over the course of several decades. Uh, Paul Hanford has documented this very carefully over the course of many, many decades. And the amazing thing is that these birds' songs change predictably as the landscape changes. So with deforestation, their songs change over the decades. And then in other areas where the forests are recovering, their songs change as well. So a song that we might associate with, and I'm making this up as I go along here, so don't quote me in the exact geography, but a song that we might associate with, let's say, Panama may actually appear in, let's say, Argentina as the entire acoustic landscape changes. Hmm. I think that's so cool. Uh, finally, <laughs> and this is a, a very personal note here, but uh, those of you all who are involved with w, uh, with Western field ornithologists may know about this. Uh, my son, Andrew Floyd, and I have been looking at the transmission of a um, a song-like meme in, in uh, bush tits. And we believe that this began actually somewhere here in the Boulder, Denver, maybe Greeley area, and uh, it's quickly spreading uh, across Colorado and now into to Utah as well. So in the same way that humans learn catchy songs, uh, birds also uh, mix it up and they can spread those songs through the environment. This is something that uh, Paul Hanford as sort of a uh, lone pioneer was figuring out in the uh, late 20th century. But now with this massive crowdsourced element with lots of us, thousands of us, or tens of thousands of us recording songs, I think we're really going to do a much better job of documenting how birds like uh, white-throated sparrows and um, Rufus Collard Sparrows and Bush Tits are uh, um, creating brand new songs and transmitting them bird to bird. Uh, finally, Nate, you mentioned White Crown Sparrow. You weren't totally wrong there. Uh, there was some excellent work in San Francisco in the 1970s. Yeah, that, I may have been conflating some yep. of that. Yep. Some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Zona Turkey is just such an incredible um, sort of proven ground for studying uh, studying bird songs. So yeah, a White Crown Sparrow was a, it was a mistake, but it was a very credible mistake uh, as well. So yep, yeah, cool. Um, I have one more question, and then mm -hmm. uh, as we're getting close to 10 minutes past nine, uh, mm -hmm. what about insects, Ted? Do you do spectrograms <laughs> with insects? I wonder if that's somebody who knows me. Uh, yeah, Maybe. so I sure, I, 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 I sure do. Um, 
I, I had a uh, sort of a, an epiphany with insects only five or six years ago. You know, for quite some time, I was just really annoyed by by insects and by by, by crickets in particular. They can just dominate uh, these recordings, and you want to get rid of them. And just it, it occurred to me at some point that well, maybe you can actually learn cricket song as well. And uh, I'm really quite new to this now. Uh, I still go out and get life crickets, life katydids, uh, life grasshoppers. Um, by the way, not just their stridulations, but even their, um, what is the word I'm looking for? They, uh, their um, crepitations, uh, the sounds they make with their wings when they, when they fly off. Those are actually species specific in, uh, in some grasshoppers. There is, and this is just sort of a tribute to being alive in the 2020s, a website that just to somebody of my age is uh, just miraculous. It's called Singing Insects of North America, S-I-N-A. It's run out of the uh, entomology department at Florida State University. I don't know who put that together or how they had the time to do it, but it is unbelievable. You have just songs at different temperatures and different latitudes and longitudes of all of the singing insects of North America. So that has just been an incredible resource for me. And uh, it's wonderful to go out and learn uh, new things about birds, but with me for crickets and other um, orthopterans, uh, to learn brand new uh, insects is just so exciting. So yes, I've been listening to, uh, to crickets a lot, and uh, I confess that they really are uh, vying for my attention. Birds will always be my first love, but uh, cricket song is really, really an amazing and just brand new uh, area for exploration and discovery. I can definitely second uh, the Bird Sounds website that you just uh, cited. I have used that to uh, identify crickets in my neighborhood as well. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. So yeah, Mia McPherson notes that uh, you sent her a spectrogram of a cricket. I did. Uh, and so she says. <laughs> I maybe you've sent so many spectrograms of crickets to so many people you can't even keep track of how many people you have. I'm gonna have, have to follow up with her later and see what she's talking about. That may have been a mistake. You, typically, um, me and I um, send photos of molting birds back and forth to one <laughs> another. So I don't know why I sent her a cricket, but I'll have to uh, to look into this matter. Very well, good. before we uh, say yep, before we say good night, I do want to note that uh, this VBC10 code is good through Friday if you would like to join the ABA with a 10% discount. Uh, or 10%, $10, $10 discount, uh, even better than 10%. Uh, $10 <laughs> discount, use VBC10 and join the ABA. Um, otherwise, it's we're, we're at quarter past just about, so I'm going to say good night. Uh, thank you to everybody who is watching uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. And uh, thank you once again, Ted, for a fantastic presentation. And we'll be back uh, probably next month for another virtual bird club. Please keep an eye out on ABA social media channels, and we'll let you know when that is coming. Other than that, hey. that's, that's all I got. Thanks very much. Thank Good you, night, everybody. everybody. Good night.